were coming from and by the speakers, and mostly from the radiology fellows out in Texas. Uh, they enjoyed coming over. So uh, x-rays, the uh, x-rays themselves were discovered in the 19th century, you see right here, uh, by William Rifkin, and um, up until about 1960, uh, you didn't say, I want a, a, an x-ray, you say you would order a Rifkin ray. Um, so it wasn't until about the 60s that it moved over to uh, x-rays. This is the, the first documented x-ray, um, and um, the amount of, I can't even imagine the amount of radiation his wife was exposed to. <laughs> to get this. Okay, so the lecture objectives, uh, we have several lecture objectives. We're going to look at the different kinds of modalities, the indications for them, uh, why they're good, why they're bad, and uh, we'll move on through here. But before I do that, I would tell you that my wife on Saturday I went down to the Caymans, and yeah. so she sent me a picture today <laughs> at lunch that as I'm in the calf eating lunch, this is her. <laughs> 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 So she had uh, surgery on that ankle, and so that's, uh, she's got her ankle propped up. So we yeah, hope she gets a sunburn. Anyway, throughout the lecture, there are going to be several points to consider or considerations. So these are the things I want you to you know, understand uh, as you read them. Uh, one of the things here is that if you're going to x ray somebody, the amount of irradiation that they receive is many, many, many fold that what you get in the background environment. As a matter of fact, the, um, the number of uh, CAT scans today are reduced because of, over the past 10 years, people realize that every time you go to the emergency room, you don't need a CAT scan of the abdomen or a CAT scan of the thorax. Now, even when you get, um, when I received at Good Shepherd the results of an ER visit, say at Integris, they will calculate the amount of exposure that they got, uh, and that's for their own liability reasons. <coughs> so you try not to uh, x ray somebody unless you really, really need to do so. Now, plain film x rays are um, relatively low dose. Um, the second bullet point, though, is very important. You never x-ray a pregnant abdomen. Now, you can use uh, lead aprons and lead shielding if you need to get an x-ray of, say, a long bone of a pregnant woman, but you never x-ray an abdomen because, as you see here, a 40% risk of malignancy in 10 years. That's just staggering uh, right there. Okay. Uh, how x-rays are produced, well, you have a cathode here that you apply electricity to it in the form of 50 to 150,000 volts. Um, for a standard chest x-ray, you're going to use somewhere in the neighborhood of probably 80 to 120,000 volts. Anybody here an x-ray tech? I think it's 150. Okay, so if I say something wrong, just feel free to correct me. Uh, most of them are making up the stuff. So, um, so a normal uh, chest x-ray, depending on how thick you are, is gonna be about 80 to 120. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll, I'll explain why there's a variation uh, later on. But the the um, electrons that come flying off the cathode cathode are going to strike the anode, and as they do so, they produce uh, uh, irradiation. Now, x-rays are a particle that travels in a beam, it's ionizing, it goes all the way through you. Um, it's the stuff that causes damage to DNA, and that's why you don't want to overexpose anybody if you have to, if, if you can avoid it. The more kilovolts you plug into this side of the equation, the, the higher the energy, the uh, x-rays come off the other side of the equation. So if you need to, if you're going to um, x-ray somebody who's thicker, you need a higher level of energy to penetrate that tissue. So 
there's, a, there's an actual uh, art and science to that and being able to know how many kilovolts I'm going to shoot you with versus how many I'm going to shoot you with and so on down the line. Okay. Um, <clears throat> if you look at uh, the images that are produced by an x-ray, now back in the old days, and I say back in the old days, five years ago, um, we had uh, this right here. So this is a um, piece of plastic. It has silver impregnated uh, plastic, uh, a coat on it. It's just like the, the uh, film that you would have developed at, at Walgreens. Um, so you put this behind the object and the x-rays are going to penetrate the object. Where the x-rays strike and you develop this, it's black. So if it, if it goes through without any hindrance, it's going to be black. If it's prevented from going through and you develop this, it'll be white. So you need to keep that in mind. The more black something is, the more x-rays hit the, the target. Now, this is, that was then, this is now. Instead of uh, shooting x-rays onto plastic film, you shoot it, you shoot them onto um, a, a, a reader that um, takes that signal and converts it into ones and zeros, and you, uh, you make it a digital image. So the x-ray machine over at Good Shepherd even is a digital x-ray, and, and most people, you, uh, you're gonna see this now, not the plain film. Okay, but regardless, the, the image itself is the same. It's unchanged, with one exception. When you have this, this is the image you have, period. There's very little you can do to, to alter that image. You can put a brighter light behind it, or a more dim light, or you know, hold a magnifier up to it if you, if you had to. This right here, because it's now digital, you can manip manipulate in a thousand different ways. <coughs> okay, but the base image is the same. The four densities are the same. The first density here that you see up at the top is gas or air. That means it blocks no x-rays, it's going to be the darkest versus the other opposite end of the spectrum, the calcified bone is going to be white. It's blocked to most x-rays. It's going to be white. And there are two densities in between that that you regularly describe. One of them is for fat, which is a little more dense than uh, air, like the lungs, but not as dense as a solid organ like the liver. So you can see all four of them here. The liver is less dense than the bone. It's more dense than the, than the, um, the fat, which is more dense than the air. And what your goal is in x-rays or CT or MRI is to have contrasting tissues. That's what enables you to see things is the contrast between one density and the other. Now, if you look, just looking at plain films like this, your human eye, in trying to pick out the different uh, densities from black to white, everything from black to white is gray. You, your eyes, human eyes, can see about 20 different shades of gray in terms of distinguishes them. And, and that's probably a person with perfect vision and the perfect setting and the perfect light uh, Generally, though, you're looking at four. And it's not 50 shades of gray, which is, I know that's why you got that smirk on your face. Oh, my God. 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 Look at red teeth. Look at red teeth. So that's a shade of red. Wait till we get to CTs where there are 2,000 shades of red. Okay. Any questions about this? Any questions about this? All right. So enhancing x-rays. Uh, to make x-rays better. So when you, uh, and by the way, an x-ray machine does not have a, a little nugget of uranium in it, or radium, or anything. There's no radioactive 
substance in the machine. There's none. It's purely what? Did I get back to the Fifty Shades of Grey? I said nugget because in, uh, back in the 1960s, in the old X-ray machines, there was a radioactive source in there. So, like William Rankin, what he did was uh, he took a piece of lead and put it there with this radioactive nugget. He would move the lead over and then put the lead back. Back in the 1960s, I believe it was, um, there was an old x-ray machine that was sitting, sitting in a mission in somewhere in South America. I can't remember where it was, but it had an actual radioactive source in it. The little kids from the town, the, the community, got into this abandoned mission and opened up that machine and found that yellow rock and took it and shared it among themselves. All of them, they all died because of radioactive poisoning. In fact, the whole town was the, the dirt and everything was so radioactive, they had to bulldoze the entire town. Uh, so that's why I make a special point. There is no radioactive stuff in a machine anymore, okay? Uh, okay, so what happens is when you uh, heat up that, uh, that cathode and the electron strike that anode, the, the gamma rays are going to come flying out, or the particulate, the x-rays, are going to come flying out in all directions. So if you have an object sitting here that you're, uh, you're, you want an x-ray, understand that those x-rays are going to be just bouncing off the walls and they're going to be scattered all over the place. What you want to do is focus the beam. And by, by doing that, you can have a much sharper image. So one of the ways to focus the beam is to use what's called a Buffy grid. And it's a series of parallel um, uh, bars that only allow the flow of x-rays that are perpendicular to the, to the target to get through. That way you don't have all of these x-rays that are, that are scattered. And that produces a more focused and refined film. It used to be, back in my days, when I was a PA student, you had to put, you had to insert the Bucky film between the patient and the, and the x-ray, I mean, the, the x-ray machine and the patient. You don't do that now, it's, it's built into the machine. But uh, nonetheless, this is one way to enhance it. Another way to enhance it is the use of fluoroscopy or x-ray, I mean, uh, digital screens like we, like I described earlier, okay? All right. So the top bullet point there about change the kilovoltage uh, will change your ability to drive x-rays through <laughs> tissues. If, um, I, you know, when I was a PA student, uh, we didn't have a technician. If somebody came into the ER, the community <clears throat> hospital ER at night, we took the x-rays. And I had no, none of us had any training in shooting x-rays. You know, they told us how to shoot them, you know, in a five minute lesson. So I'd shoot your chest x-ray and it would be all white. <laughs> well, that's not right. <laughs> More energy into that one. I'd shoot it and it'd be all black. We're going to back off a little bit. So um, there's a table that the uh, radiology technicians have used that will, that, that can precisely, you know, they look at your body habits and say, okay, you're a small person, use this, use 80 kilovolts on your chest, use um, 60 kilovolts on your abdomen or whatever. I had a, when I was uh, moonlighting up in Kingfisher, there was a guy uh, came in, he weighed uh, 600 and something pounds. And the only reason I know that is because they weighed, he was in the ambulance, they weighed, they went through the grain elevator on the way to the hospital, they dropped him off and then they went through the grain elevator on the way back and they called him with his weight. So uh, he weighed 680 pounds and he, of course he had an abdominal chief complaint. So we were trying to shoot an x-ray and the machine, when it, once it gets so hot, it shut down and that's what happened with him. It was, he was too thick to penetrate. Yes, Paul. Um, my wife's had to deal with some patients and they take them to the zoo to use their x-ray machine. Yeah. If they're that big. Yeah. Uh, if they can't treat at a hospital, they take them to the zoo. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. I mean, I was really concerned when he got up, when I, I went over to get, the table was about this high, you know, it's a little bit taller than normal. Yeah, I just remember looking at, over his abdomen. I mean, neither one of us actually thought that the x ray tech or I thought it was going to penetrate, but we thought we'd give it a shot. And obviously, there are weight limits in being able to use a CT, um, MRI, and things like that because you won't go through the tube. So anyway, that's why they have open MRIs and various other modalities to get around that. Okay, so uh, points to consider here. Uh, when you get a chest x-ray, for example, um, there's two ways to look at it. You can look at it, remember you're taking a three-dimensional object and squishing it into two. So if I look, if I take a chest x-ray, um, how do I know if I hold that chest x-ray up and the heart is on the left side, how do I know that's correct or that's correct? How do, how do I know? And well, if you get, does it make a difference if, you shoot, if the x-ray enters the patient from this side or this side? You're still gonna get the three dimensions squished to the two. Well, yes, it does make a difference with, because of several of the points I'm gonna make. But one of them is when you're talking about a chest x-ray, uh, what you want to order is a PA uh, chest x-ray. PA, that means the beam penetrated the skin from posterior to anterior. Posterior to anterior. And I'll explain why that is in just a minute. But if you're, inter if you're interested in the heart and lungs, you want to shoot a PA. If you're interested in the spine, you would shoot an AP. Okay? Now, you don't have to tell the x-ray tech anymore really I want a PA of the chest it's a given if you say I want a, I want a, an x-ray of the spine it's a given which direct you're going to get the AP but if you want to be uh, exact in your ordering um, go ahead and say I want a PA of the chest and keep in mind that there's no view because you're taking everything three, three dimensions and squishing them into two if I took if I have a bullet enter my chest and I'm looking at this right here, and I see that that bullet is sitting right there inside my heart. It does me no good if I only have one view because it's a three dimensions. I have to take another view 90 degrees from the first to find that that bullet, I, was, I had it taped to my, to my chest right here. You understand what I mean? Okay, so you have to, in almost all circumstances, you have to have, you have to shoot x-rays uh, at least two views, 90 degrees from each other. There are some exceptions to that, but that's generally, generally the rule. Okay, so if I shot a PA chest, I would shoot a lateral chest. That's 90 degrees. On some instances, you remember the Scotty dogs back in anatomy when we talked about the lumbar and ankylosing spondylitis? I said the Scotty dogs. You get that view with an oblique view of the lumbar spine. So you're not AP, I mean AP or lateral, you're like 45 degrees, and that'll give you the Scotty dog uh, view. Right or left lateral decubitus means you're just lying on your side either the right side or the left side. I'll explain why you would want to do that later on. Now, you always view plain film as if you're standing there looking at the patient. I think I mentioned that in anatomy. So that's why, that's why if you're looking at a plain film, if the patient is looking at you, the heart is on the left. The patient's left, which is where it should be. Understand that you could put that film up and the heart is over there if you just turn the page around, right? If you just turn the film around. So this is correct. To make it not correct, all I have to do is do that and now it's not correct. So you always put the film up as if you're looking at the patient. So now when you start watching medical shows on TV, and you'll see chest x-rays, they always put a chest x-ray up on a light box, even though nobody uses a light box anymore. <laughs> About half the time, they'll put them up backwards and you'll say, ah, the heart's on the right. 
Okay. <laughs> um, there are uh, markers uh, that radiology technician will put a left or right on the, uh, the film. You see where that says right? That means that this is the right, right form. And then it says right there, bubbles with beads. You see that little circle? There's three little dots inside of it. The bubbles with beads are uh, is this. There's a, a right marker up there. Uh, this one has uh, on it PA. They tell you that it's a PA. Uh, and just as a, uh, uh, to illustrate a point I made earlier about contrasting densities, here's the air in the top of your stomach. So the gastric air bubble you should see on the left and along with the heart, okay? All right, so here are the bubbles with the beads. There's a, a left and a right. There's a little plastic bubble. You see those three little beads in there? If you are standing straight up, the beads are going to fall to the bottom. So in, in this illustration right here, the R, somebody's holding it up. So the beads are at the bottom. If you're putting it flat like this, the beads are going to be at the bottom of the bubble, which will mean they'll be in the center of the circle which is where these are. These are in the center of the circle, meaning the person didn't x-ray it with his hand up, his x-ray was taken with his hand flat on the table. Okay? So if you want to tell if this image is upright or supine, just look for the bubbles with the beads. Okay? Uh, sometimes they'll put a, an arrow in there. It'll be pointing up. If it's an upright, they'll point it horizontal. If it's a... Um, not upright, supine, for example. When you shoot uh, x-rays of the abdomen, you shoot two views, upright and supine. So they would uh, note that, and if you want to order a, an upright and supine um, abdominal film, that's a kidney, kidney, urinary bladder. You put upright and horizontal or supine, KUB, that's how you would order a, an abdominal film. Okay, you would never order just one. Well, rarely would you ever have an indication to order just one. Okay. Another point to consider. All right, now this is the PA versus AP. The greater the distance from the film, the greater the object is going to appear on that film. So if we look at this illustration right here, we have an object that's the same size. It's the same width. In this example, we put it close to the source. In this example, we put it closest to the film. You can see that the more accurate depiction of the size of that object is when it's closest to the film. When it's furthest away, you have a tendency for the X-ray beam to keep traveling in that direction, and it gives a false widening. That's why, in the example of a chest x-ray, the most important structures in the chest are the heart and lungs. You want to put them as close to the film as possible. If you're interested in the spine, you turn them around and put the spine so that the, the, the uh, x-rays are now penetrating AP. Right? So that's the explanation behind that. Another point to, the, uh, um, to discuss here is, um, it's, it starts out the bullet point there, follow-up exams. If I admit you for pneumonia today, and I start you on antibiotics, I got you on breathing treatments, I put you on steroids, um, and the next day you're worse. Uh, I've x-rayed you, you have pneumonia. The next day you're worse, get a follow-up exam. See if there's been a change for the worse or for the better between yesterday and today, or two days ago, or whatever. Don't be afraid of follow-up exams when you're treating a patient in the hospital or, or uh, in the surgery area. My, my wife, you know, with her ankle, um, two weeks later, you know, we go to the follow-up visit, they x-ray her. A month later, they x-ray her again. What are they looking for? They're looking that nothing's displaced initially, 
And in the follow-up visit, a month later, they're looking for callus formation or bone regrowth. So, you know, the serial uh, x-rays, don't, don't forget about those. Okay, now the, the bottom bullet point there, horizontal films for air fluid interface. If you're standing up, you can see the difference in density between the air and the fluid in that bottle of water. Now, if you were to look at that interface though, on FOSS, meaning like on the edge or from the front, this is what you see. That's the same bottle turned that way. Actually, it's not the same bottle. I couldn't find the same image <laughs> twice, but you see what I mean. You're not going to see an air fluid interface that way. That's one of the reasons why abdominal films are shot 90 degrees, because one of them will give you an air fluid interface if such a thing is existing in that abdomen. This one, though, you should recognize is going to give you, because you take, um, is that cut? Thank you. If you take a tube like this, so this tube has fluid in it, blood, for example, and you turn it and shoot it this direction, understand that you're, there's a difference in density here between the blood that's inside the, the vessel and the outside of the vessel that's made up of muscle, right? So you should be able to see uh, within these lungs here, um, you see it best on the lateral view, actually, little circles. And you see those circles because you're getting the pulmonary arteries and the bronchi, you're looking at the whole thickness of the structures, and that's what causes those circles, okay? But you won't see air fluid levels in them unless you're in the right position. This is one of the positions to be in. This is a lateral decubitus position. There was fluid in the, in the, uh, uh, the recess in this person. You put them on their side, and now you can see the meniscus and the fluid as it shifted. We went over this in anatomy, so this might should be a surprise to you. Okay? A couple of points, to, a couple more points to consider. Because x-rays look for differences in density, if you have two objects of the same density that are next to each other, you're gonna lose the boundary between the two structures. If you take a fluid-filled heart and a fluid-filled lung and put them next to each other, they're gonna appear the same density. You're not gonna be able to see the, car the heart uh, border on the right or left. And I'll show you an example of that later on. The other is if you take a normal density, like the, the bronchus is full of air, and normally it's going through an air-filled lung, so you shouldn't be able to see anything unless you're looking at it like that. Ordinarily, you don't see the bronchi going into the lung. However, if you put an infiltrate in the lungs, loaded up with pneumonia, which has a different density than air, you're gonna see the white pneumonia with the dark bronchi running through it. That's called an air bronchogram. Here are the examples of both. Here's a pneumonia in the right middle lobe. Uh, outlines the right middle lobe classically. You'll never see anything this perfect in your careers, uh, but this is a nice right middle lobe pneumonia. You can see that the density here is nearly the same as the heart, so you lose the right heart border. Uh, it's, it's difficult to see anyway, okay? You can also look up here. There's the trachea coming down the mediastinum, and then it bifurcates, and you can follow that right vein on into that infiltrate because that's an air bron bronchogram. Air bronchogram are always pathologic. Always. Can anybody see that? Can you find the, that one? Yeah, maybe, let me turn the lights off. It's more apparent when you do that. You can see that uh, bronchus going all the way down into that. Uh, and that's just because you've got a, an air-filled tube surrounded by this um, uh, infiltrate from infection. 
Okay. Uh, portable films, if your patient can't get to the x-ray department, x-ray department will come to you. Uh, these things, everybody knows about these. They've seen them in the hallway. They're digital now. They used to be really bulky uh, when you had these plates that you had to carry, uh, that the technician had to carry. But now that uh, everything <coughs> is, is this way, what they carry now is just the, the digital uh, reader. So if you have somebody coming in uh, with pneumonia, like uh, Professor Reggio, go ahead, like that. Like Professor Reggio is sitting in the, e, in the ER, what I'm gonna do is, or they're gonna do is take this thing, motor it in there, boom, they're gonna uh, put that arm right in front of her, they're gonna get her to lean up, they're gonna put this behind her, and now they're gonna shoot it, okay? Now obviously if they, and then this is gonna read the stuff for you. Now obviously this is not an ideal chest x-ray for several reasons. One, it's AP. Two, these things can't generate a high, as high an energy level as one mounted to the wall. Three, when you shoot a PA film, if you guys have ever had it done, you walk up to the reader and you put your arms up here like this to pull your scapula out of the way, or you grab a hold of these bars that are up here. You're standing upright, they tell you to take a deep breath, and you want to see at least all the way down to the 10th uh, rib. Remember I said that in the anatomy, 10th rib. Well, if she's in the ice, I mean, uh, the ER with all sorts of fractures and infection and just gooed up, She's not gonna be able to take a deep breath. She may not even be able to take a breath at all. I mean, um, you know, under my command, you know, take a deep breath. She may not be able to do that. So they're gonna be underinflated. They're gonna be poorly, improperly exposed. They're gonna be magnified. Malposition. And what? Malposition. And malposition, yep. Which is what you can see in this one right here. This no looks nothing like the uh, images I've shown you before, okay? Well, that's, a, that's everything you get uh, with it. But if you gotta get an x-ray and she can't go to x-ray, this is, this is your next option, okay? Can you say those four things again? It was proper to, poorly inflated, improperly positioned, malpositioned. I just made them up as I was going along. I'm not sure. Okay, uh, they poor inflation. Yeah. She's going. That's not going to be positioned correctly. Yeah. Uh, it will be under penetrated because it doesn't have enough energy to get it. You know, it comes out of the wall, and it's going to be magnified because it's an AP and not a PA. Um, I think a poor expansion um, is also there. Did I say that already? Yeah, no, okay, okay. So, no, I was talking about inflation like the U.S. economy. The inflation <laughs> two point. Uh, okay, anyway. All right, everybody okay? Did I get them all? Yep. We'll watch the video. Okay, watch the video. All right. uh, points of, uh, to consider here. Uh, okay, well. Some things are not uh, are not going to show up on an X-ray. So if I get you to drink a milkshake with barium in it, barium is a is a metallic substance like drinking chalk or or calcium. Um, it's radio opaque. Remember, radio opaque means it won't go through there. Radio lucent means it will. Right. So you're drinking this barium. You can drink it like as a barium swallow, or you can go up the backside as a barium enema. Um, either way, um, back in the old days, uh, the barium enema was a root, very routine uh, procedure, but now uh, the CT has pretty much replaced that. Uh, understand that if you take a swallow barium or it goes up your backside, understand that you're getting a, a picture of the you're getting a cast of the lumen of the structure. <coughs> you're not getting and you're not getting a picture of a big tumor that may be sitting out in the muscularis layer. You're only getting a cast of the lumen. And I think I may have showed you this in, in anatomy. Did I show you like a colon cancer? A colon cancer. If you were doing a barium enema to diagnose colon cancer, and that's what we that's the only thing we had for years. 
because we didn't have fiber optics that could get all the way up there, um, what you would be looking for is a filling defect. This is the barium. So the, the colon is here. This would be the tumor right there. So you're looking for a filling defect because you're only looking at the lumen. Now if that if the tumor was there, you would completely miss it. Okay, that's what I mean by that. Okay. Also, you can put contrast in the in, uh, intravenously. You can do it intravenously. Uh, if you're looking at different systems, the uh, vascular system is one thing. You can highlight the vascular system by injecting contrast into the vein. You can also uh, inject contrast into the vein, have the kidneys filter it out, and then uh, send it down the ureters into the bladder. This, was the, this uh, <coughs> process was called an IVP, intravenous pyelogram. And what that did was it, if you had an obstruction, like a stone, you would see that the contrast would go down the ureters but stop. You couldn't follow the ureter all the way into the bladder. Or if there was a renal cancer, you would see it as a filling defect in the kidney. Luckily, we don't do IVPs much anymore. Very, very rarely would an IVP done because everything shows up now on CT in terms of the renal system. The thing you always have to worry about though with contrast material uh, is uh, allergy. People have um, not really allergies to barium. I've seen a few of them, but not very many. Uh, mostly it's iodine people will develop an allergy to. And it's pretty scary when you're injecting this stuff into somebody and all of a sudden they start pumping like this. There's their tongue's feeling bigger. And uh, I'm having a hard time breathing. So if you were doing that, what would you do? What would you do? Tell me what you would do. What? What? Okay, you can put EpiPen. EpiPen will be good. EpiPen will buy you about 20 minutes. What else are you going to do? Steroids. You got to get some IV steroids in place. What else you want to do? Flush them out. Flush them out. Well, if it's IV, you, you, it's gone. I mean, if it's barium, you, you won't stop giving it. Is what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> you won't go with that. What you meant? You would stop giving it. All right. So steroids, epinephrine. What else? Would you give them fluids? Well, you give them fluids. I mean, it's not going to help anything, but you give them fluids. And histamines, and histamines. Give them a Benadryl, give them a, a Zantac. Actually, give them both. Yeah, give them both. Um, H1 and H2 blockers. Uh, what else can you do? What else can you do? We had it in the anatomy. I, I'm not sure what you said, but if you said an albuterol inhaler, you would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why are you going to give them an albuterol inhaler? It's a sympathomimetic. Okay, it'll dilate. Okay, but nothing's going to help more than the uh, EpiPen and the steroids. Okay. All right. Yeah, IV steroids. Don't rub it on there for it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here's some examples here. A barium swallow. You know, you can use barium uh, swallows to look for esophageal tumors. Uh, you can also, uh, about the only time they're used now, though, is when you're doing uh, motility studies in the uh, esophagus. If you're worried about an esophageal tumor, they're going to get a CAT scan. Um, now, in some instances, uh, when you order a CT, like a CT of the abdomen, I want a CT of the abdomen, the radiologist is, is going to ask you, do you want it with or without contrast? Because if they can, if you can contrast the lumen of the bowel and the blood vessels, that really helps them. So most times now you're going to do, you're going to order CTs with and without contrast. If you only want it without contrast, you have to specify that. And an example would be if you had a knock on the head or if you had somebody with a suspected stroke, you don't want to be squirting contrast material into a vessel that's going to leak out into the brain. You want to just do a CT, a non-contrast CT. Most other instances, though, you're going to use with and without contrast. So 
Here's our coronary angiography. You can see the, uh, what artery is that? That's the left coronary, that's the right coronary, there's the marginal, that's the LAD, that's the posterior interventricular, that's the anterior interventricular, the LAD, uh, no that is right there, that's one, the top one, that's the, that's the left marginal right there. You can see the LAD going all the way down to the apex of the heart. So if we come over here to this side, uh, here are the two vertebral arteries, the basal artery, posterior cerebral, the two internal carotids. There's the uh, posterior cerebral going back on that side. You can see it on that side right there. These two are the anterior cerebral. There's the middle cerebral going off on either side. So yeah, you can uh, highlight these uh, vessels uh, pretty amazing as well, okay? This is a um, uh, barium enema right here. You can see where the colon is outlined. One of the things that they use barium for now is kind of, uh, it's uh, interesting is um, in pediatrics, you're gonna learn about a condition called intussusception. It's like 18 syllables, but it, there are 50 S's in this word, intussusception. What it means is if you've got this tube, the tube starts going into itself, right? It's, it uh, intussuscepts. <laughs> telescope, the telescope into itself, right? One of the treatments to get it undone, and it always telescopes in from the bottom up. So one of the treatments uh, in these little kids is you give them uh, barium to drink, um, and as it goes down, the viscosity of the barium will push the intussusception uh, back out. So that's one of the first things you want to try with intussusception. If you happen to see that, if that's your question on Jeopardy this weekend, okay? <laughs> Why don't you take a break and then we'll come back. Yes, No, you just have the computers lying around. Gotcha. <laughs> the whole thing had to be reformatted. Oh, gosh. I'm sorry. Do you need my phone or is it still working? Still working. Okay.